This is the second time in a month I found myself sitting in a cemetery talking to a camera. It's, it's funny how your life turns out, guys. There are two ways we can try and understand the behavior of our earliest hominid ancestors. We can look at chimpanzees and how they behave, and we can try our best to interpret the archaeological evidence, obviously. So using these two sources, what can we infer about how our earliest hominid ancestors treated the dead? First, let's talk about chimpanzees, our hairy forest-dwelling cousins. It's important to say that they are not hominids stuck in time. For the last five, six million years, we've been on our own evolutionary journeys. Just because chimpanzees act one way, it doesn't mean our earliest ancestors did. Even if there's a situation where they act the same, they might be doing it for entirely different reasons. There might be an entirely different thought process going on in their minds. But that being said, if there is something really ancient and fundamental about how we treat the dead, it stands to reason that the next best place to look for that behavior is in our closest relative, chimps. Allow me to read to you how chimpanzees in the Ivory Coast reacted to the death of Tina, a chimpanzee in their group, when she was attacked by a leopard. We arrived at 8.17 and found six males and six females sitting silently near the body. During a period of one hour and 20 minutes, Ulysses, Macho, and Brutus groomed Tina's body for 55 minutes. This was unusual because neither Ulysses nor Macho were ever seen to groom Tina alive, and the other males rarely did so for a few seconds. Nearby, subadults and low-ranking females inspected with great intensity the place where the attack had taken place, and where the ground showed clear traces of a fight with traces of blood. In contrast to what had happened when Ella was wounded by a leopard, not a single drop of blood was licked. Goma and Hera approached and they were allowed to smell the wounds, whereas their two infants were chased away by Odine and Brutus. Ceres wanted to approach, but Brutus chased her away and she fled screaming. From 1010 onwards, the flies on the body were numerous and started to be a nuisance for the chimpanzees. They waved them away frequently and removed the eggs laid in the nose, eyes, and wounds of the neck. Two hours and 38 minutes after Tina's death, Tarzan came to smell gently over different parts of the body and he inspected her genitals. He was the only infant allowed to do this. Then Tarzan groomed her for a few seconds and pulled her hand gently many times looking at her. 11.45. Most chimpanzees stayed at 5 meters from the body due to the impressive number of flies, the males coming closely intermittently to wave them away. Many chimpanzees left the site for a while to feed and come back later. In all, there were chimpanzees constantly with the body for 6 hours and 50 minutes. Clearly, there is something going on in the brains of these chimpanzees. They're reacting to it in a really interesting way. The access to the body is restricted. Elite members of the group are grooming her, even though they didn't when she was alive. There's a lot of curiosity around the body, a lot of playing with the body, touching it, dragging it. They stay with her for hours, even after they need to feed, even after the flies become a real nuisance. They still stay with the body for almost seven hours. They know she's not injured. There's no attempt to treat the wounds. They know Tina has died and they are reacting to it in a really specific and interesting way. This isn't the only evidence of chimpanzees behaving uniquely around the dead. Chimpanzee mothers are known to carry their young after they have died for sometimes months until they're just a rotting corpse on the back of their body. Perhaps as some sort of process of grieving or detachment. We don't know, we can only guess, but chimpanzees understand when a member of their group has died and they have specific behavior around that. That's about as much as we can say. But can we, in the archaeological sites that we have, try and see any of this kind of behavior in our earliest ancestors? The first site I'm going to talk about today is at Hadar in Ethiopia. Archaeologists there have found 
13 individuals identified as Australopithecus afarensis, a hominid that lived around 2 million-ish years ago. If you know the fossil Lucy, she was an afarensis and also from Hadar. What is really interesting about these 13 individuals is that they were found in just 7 meters squared. How did so many end up so closely buried together? Well, there are a lot of theories about that. None of them are perfect. All of them are possible. The first is that they were left there by a predator. That's definitely possible. Certainly, Australopithecus would fall victim to a predator every now and again. But 13 of them so close together. There's little modification of the bones. Some of the bones are articulated, so this carcass was not entirely ripped apart. And they're also aren't the remains of other animals that you might expect if this was a, a regular place that a predator lived. Nevertheless, it's possible, but that theory has its flaws. The second theory is that a flash flood swept all these hominids away. The geology of the site suggests that it was a wooded hill next to a stream, so it's definitely possible that that stream flooded from time to time. But if the flood was so powerful that it wiped out an entire group, you would probably think that the bodies would be really dispersed and really spread out. It's not impossible, but again, it has its flaws. The third is that they were trapped in a bog, that these hominids were making their way through the landscape, got stuck in the mud, and uh, couldn't get out and just died there. It's definitely possible, but it was on the side of a hill. Hills tend to not be boggy, although they definitely can be. Trust me, when I did my Duke of Edinburgh, I spent Many a weekend on boggy hills in Wales, but it's not without its flaws. You know, 13 individuals following each other one after another into a bog to, to die. Well, Professor Paul Petit of the University of Durham, a professor of mine, in fact, when I was at good old Sheffield Uni, he thinks we cannot rule out that these hominids were not left there deliberately. Certainly not buried. There's weathering on the bones, which suggests that they were exposed to the elements, and certainly we wouldn't see direct evidence of burial until Neanderthals and Homo sapiens evolve. But perhaps as some sort of deliberate abandonment, structured abandonment, it's certainly possible and we should not rule that theory out. Many thousands of miles away and hundreds of thousands of years into the future, Atapuerca in northern Spain shows much more direct evidence of hominid involvement with the disposal of the dead. The site called the Gran Delina, 10 individuals assigned as Homo antecessor, probably the last direct relative between humans and Neanderthals, 10 of them were found again by coincidence in 7 meters squared. It must be a conspiracy, guys. The number 7, it comes up too often. Interestingly, these bones show clear evidence of cannibalism. So there is clearly a hominid involved in their disposal. There are cut marks all over the bones, identical marks to what you would find in a butchered animal. The long bones have been broken to extract the marrow. Clearly, whoever left them there was participating in cannibalism. Maybe for survival reasons, maybe for ritual reasons, Maybe in their mind there's no difference between doing something to survive and doing something as part of a ritual. At another site at Adapuerca called the Cima de los Huesos, literally the pit of bones, an incredible 28 individuals were found at the bottom of this cave. Assigned to Homo heidelbergensis, how were so many buried together. Well, as with Hadar, there are lots of theories and none of them are perfect. Again, you've got the predators, you've got some sort of catastrophe, you've got perhaps that they fell into the pit, but none of these are perfect. A key piece of evidence, though, is that these bones were deliberately broken before they were covered up by sediment in the cave. Also, they did not have any cut marks, unlike the Grandolina, so this body was deposited in the cave with its flesh intact. It wasn't some sort of cannibalism. It's difficult to imagine some sort of situation where a hominid was not directly involved in that behavior. As Paul Petit himself says, Whatever the specific reason for why the dead came to rest in the Sema, can one fully discount the possibility that this place in the landscape was associated with the disposal of the dead, or at least some of them? It could potentially reflect a number of isolated occurrences of structured deposition of carcasses, individual caching events, 
resulting from the cultural association of a specific place with an opportunity to dispose of the dead. For me personally, I find the fact that so many were found so close together, that there's no cannibalism involved, that this wasn't a domestic site, there's no evidence of stonework or anything like that at the site. To me, that's really clear evidence that hominids were involved and that there's some sort of ritual involved in how these guys ended up there. That's what I think anyway. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Do you think we're really sort of seeing what we want to see in the evidence or do you think this is real clear evidence of the evolution of human ritual? Let me know. To wrap this video into some sort of conclusion, I think it's fair to say that our earliest ancestors shared some sort of morbid curiosity with the dead. That's a trait that we can also see in the behavior of chimpanzees and it manifested itself in cannibalism, in structured deposition of the dead, and in the deliberate destruction of carcasses. And perhaps in the course of time, this behavior evolved into burial and the rituals we would see when Neanderthals and Homo sapiens burst into the scene. Those guys are so interesting though, they'll get their own video in the future on this channel. So if you found this one interesting, stay tuned for that. This is a... <laughs> I don't know who will find this video interesting, but I certainly do. That's it. I just want to give a big shout out to the uh, main professor who was the primary source for this video, Prof. Paul Petit. He was my own lecturer when I studied at Sheffield University. He's a really interesting guy. His book is one of the best I've read all year. You don't need to be an archaeologist to understand it. It just gives you the information you need to try and understand how human ritual evolved. It's super cool. Mr. Petit, if you see this, I know you don't remember me. I spent far too much time hitting bongs rather than hitting books when I was at uni. Don't make my mistake, kids. Your uh, lectures made a profound influence on me and uh, really expanded my mind as to the, the wonders of the Stone Age. So thanks very much for that. I'm going to leave the cemetery now. I'm not going to film another video in a cemetery for a while. I don't want to get a reputation. Thanks for watching, guys. Like, comment, subscribe. Skilly ploppity doppity do. See ya.